Welcome to Winter Welcome, or Welcome Winter, and this is a banner project. I've got it cut at the top, and you can just use some Velcro or whatever, um, into our rustic banner topper. And in this case, I've used our swirly snowflake corners, which I have glittered. Oops, get you going on the right side. Um, I've just got a regular piece of rock lawn, but I've done something really fun. Okay, so I just love the way this has turned out. I'm going to glitter these with the... Um, Glamour Dust glitters on the greens and the reds after I get my picture taken. Um, it, it just it interferes. But this is magic. This is such a magical little um, scene. I had to, let's see if I can get you on camera right, I had to make a mate. Okay, so this, if you're not into your banners, this is a lovely thing that we call, sorry about the odd angles, this is a paper towel hider. Okay, and what's really great is, so that's how it works, um, you put your paper towel here and then that sits on your kitchen counter with that out. What we've done that's fantastic, besides the fact that these also hold two rolls of toilet paper and it does fit the back of a toilet tank, awesome. Um, what is also cool is these two little screws right here actually unscrew and you can take this panel off and pop a new one on and just like our Lazy Susans, that has a little screw in the bottom and a magnet there and so that is a four season or all season um, panel that you can do. You can reverse it and paint on the back side or in this case because I put this way down low I'm gonna have to just paint one side but the pieces are super cheap or we'll say affordable. So I'm super excited that we have two ways of doing this. Um, they're basically the same pattern. We have a little bit more embellishment on this one, but both are included in the same instructional DVD, and um, as well as the instructions for the toppers and everything else. I hope you enjoy the lesson. It's got so much, so much to learn. Okay, we're going to mix our base coat color for our banner, and we're going to use like five or six times and just one time of the blue. I probably ought to shake that blue just a little bit more. Okay. We just want to take, you always take when you're mixing your paint, you always take just a little bit of your dark color into your light color. Let's back you out just a little bit. This is going to be some big painting while we're getting the background. Uh, I want to mix it to a value 5. And what does a value 5 mean? It's on the um, value scale. I'll grab one of those. Um, it's the middle. Actually, this paper is about a value 5. So when you squint at your paper, you ought to be able to see that it, it kind of fades in with the paper. So if it still pops out too dark or too light, then you just keep mixing and adding a little bit more paint. So when you when you squint at it and it kind of blends with that background, that's when you know that you have, I'm going to shove the rest of that in there. Okay, and how are we getting? We're maybe still a little bit light. So you sneak up on it instead of like, you know, killing it with too much. Otherwise, then you end up adding a whole bunch of white into it and then you end up with a pile like that big. Okay, I think we're getting closer. Okay, probably most of that. And yep. All right, so I think we maybe are still one shade lighter. Whoops. Now I probably will not use all of that. So values is what shows us. Let's see, I'm squinting. Value is the, the wordage that you use to describe the darkness and lightness of a color. So a value 5 is in the middle. The scale is 1 to 10. 5 is in the middle. And the neutral gray that I'm mixing on is considered um, the perfect surface to mix on. This is a gray palette paper because you can actually see the true color. Like, see how that looks dark here? Well, if I was putting that color on black and mixing, then it would not look very different from my black. It would be really hard. And, hard to know what I was doing and I'll show you what I was talking about here. So this color right here, if I mix that on a black background, then it would not um, it would not be easy to mix. Okay, and the same thing with white. If I put white on white palette paper, it's very hard to see my values. By using the neutral color, um, then that makes it 
much easier. Okay, so enough about that. I think we're pretty close. Okay, I wanted to show you, we're going to be doing the banner, which is made out of rock lawn. There's a smooth side, which is this side, and a rough side. I prefer the rough side, and I don't have a reason for that. I have painted on both. Um, just something feels, this gets, I don't know, this feels too smooth to me for whatever reason. And I'm going to be painting on this Lazy Susan, not Lazy Susan, sorry, on this um, paper towel holder. This is actually a really unique surface. So that's a magnet in the top of that, um, that, um, that thing, <laughs> dowel. And then these just unscrew, they come pre-drilled, the base comes pre-drilled, and you just unscrew it, take the screws out, you flip it over, and now it's reversible so that you can paint one season on one side, one season on the front, and you can get extra panels so that you can actually, you know, do multiple seasons for this. So I'll be painting on this, and to seal this, we don't have to seal our rock line, but we're going to use multi-purpose sealer to roll on a coat of sealer on this surface. And that is when you want this, the surface, and I'm going to take this away, um, when you want the surface to be just consistent, you want to go ahead and use multi-purpose sealer. That just gives you an even, there are no weird things going on. Okay, I'm going to use my 2-inch foam roller that has a nubby head on it, and the reason that I like this is it doesn't leave ridges. Okay, and you'll see that that's kind of foamy looking. That is no problem at all. It actually just will calm down as it dries. And if you want it, the smoother you want it, this is kind of a neat little trick, the smoother you want it, um, the longer you roll. So if you want a really, really glass smooth kind of um, surface, then you just go ahead and roll it until the roller sings. And, and that's not quite it just yet, but it kind of is like that. Okay, so then you use less pressure, and you'll hear the roller start singing. And I don't know why it sings, but see how smooth that is now. Okay, and then we'll just set that aside and allow it to dry. Now I'll base my rock lawn using the same roller. I'm not even going to wash it. I've got two of these black non-stick mats under here. One so that I can make this one really messy. Okay, and I'll just go ahead and pull my banner off. And I'll just roll that. And you want to be careful with rollers. They have a tendency to spit. Okay, and then I'll just hold it down. And I'm just going to do this whole... Um, this is how it came from the, the website. It's just in the size. So I'm just going to go ahead and just roll one even coat all over this whole thing, just pulling down my edges so that I don't um, get it. Sometimes they'll grab, see how that'll pick up, and it'll roll back. We don't want that. And we'll go ahead and we'll base coat both sides one time. And the reason we need to do both sides is I plan on doing a little hangover thing and cutting some things out. So I want to be able to have that finished. And so before I get anything going in odd directions, I'll make sure that I have... Um, that I'll have both sides just base coated so that I can paint them both and they're both dry and all that kind of stuff. And then I also, once my wood is dried, I'll go ahead and give that a base coat too. All right, a couple things to know about the rock lawn. Number one, you can blow dry it. Number two, when you get a little bit more coats of things on it, it gets a little bit heavier. But you want to be really careful not to do excessive coats because then you can have some cracking issues when you fold it over and things. So you do want to be careful. What I like about having this black nonstick mat is I can pick this up like this and transport it away over here for drying. <clears throat> and now I can turn this piece, which is dried perfectly smooth, and I can roll it on there. Um, I would go ahead and seal both sides while I'm at it and just do the base coat on one side. That way you've got a nice even, everything's ready to go. When you're going to get ready to paint on the back side, what you would do is you would take um, when, say, you get this all finished with your snowman <clears throat> scene, then you would take um, press and seal and you would press it on here. That way, when you're working on the other side, if you run into some paint, the back side will be all protected. And so you'll have that press and seal on there. Of course, you want to wait until that's completely dry before you do that. Okay, so I have my banner um, based the first time, and it's drying. I've got both sides based. 
And sometimes this material just takes a little bit longer to dry than other stuff. So I just usually just will do this the, you know, the day before I want to paint it and I'll let it just finish curing overnight so I don't end up with any kind of, you know, stuff that shouldn't happen. I want to show you, this is how I lay out my patterns. So I'm going to use this topper, okay, which has got paint from the back side. Um, you can make them reversible. So I could have my Halloween on one side and my Christmas on the other. And I've got yellow tracing paper on a roll, and I'm going to want a long banner. And you can see that this would actually fit quite nicely. It's a little bit smaller. Um, I'd have to cut it down, but that would put my pattern on there for my banner just perfectly. But I did want to share that this yellow tracing paper on a roll comes in a 24 inch width. And the 24 inches would definitely do, and I could cut it exactly to the width that I wanted my banner to be. And it is just fantastic not to have to tape small pieces of tracing paper together. And go away, little bug. And um, so I wouldn't have to trace, put tape my pieces together. And this is wide enough to actually do floor cloths as well. The tracing paper, when you look at it, let's look at my line drawing. This is what you're going to be tracing, right? So look how perfectly clear that tracing is. It is yellow actually has less. Um, opacity than white does, so you get a much better, more transparent paper when you use the, the yellow. And you can tear it to whatever size you like. So the very first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to get my trace out. I'll, I'll lay this out, get it to the width that I think I'm going to want it. And what's nice is the paper tears straight in this direction and it tears straight in the other direction as well. So I'll lay this out and I'm going to want to give myself all the way up to the top just just so that I know where I'm at. I'll grab a marking utensil. These um, pen sticks are really nice because they don't bleed on paper. And I'll mark my hole there. Okay. And from here what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and size by folding. The old-fashioned trick of folding will give you really straight lines. Okay, so I'll fold that, and then I'll fold it again, and I'll give myself a nice, perfectly straight line. I'll use tools like this with my straight edge, and what you could do to make it smaller and easier, you could bring that to there, make sure you're keeping it straight, okay, and I'll just verify that I'm making that pretty straight. That looks really nice and even. Okay, and then what I'll do is I will mark that line right there on my edge, and I'll go ahead and cut. I'll mark it, cut it, and then I'll have nice straight lines. Then from there, that gives me the width that I want this. I'll go ahead and mark that on here. You want a see-through ruler. That way, when you're marking, you can see how close or far you are to the edge, and you can use all these different guides. Um, this is the big one. This is the 24-inch. Great for floor cloths. And round things like gourds and stuff like that as well. So I'll go ahead and get it marked. I'll trim it down to the edge size because I want to have my um, paint on that edge because it actually does make it blue instead of white, like a cut edge. So that's the process of getting the pattern ready, the rock line ready to size. The other thing that I want to do is I want to get out my L square. This is also very flexible. But what I, what you want when you're trying to cut your um, rock line is you need some square edges. So I'm going to line up my L square to check my square edges. So by folding my paper in half, I have my halfway mark, which tells me where to lay things out. I also have quarter marks, and I have the width of the, the biggest possible width of the banner. So now I can transfer or trace these marks, you know, just a couple of marks onto my rock lawn, and I can cut it down to size. All right, we're going to want to get our next coat onto our banner so it can dry. That always takes a little bit of time. I'm going to use my pop top. These come unpainted, but I used um, um, paint adhesion medium, and it's plastic. Paint adhesion medium sticks to like anything, and then I painted a cute little design on it. Nice to have a little custom. They make awesome gifts. But it cracks the paint plastic thing off and so that you don't have to you know, peel and cut and do all that kind of stuff. So I've got some Prussian blue, <clears throat> I've got ultra blue deep, I've got white, and I've got my number five, and I've got a big old giant patty here and there. Okay, so um, my number five mix of the white and the ultra blue deep. I'm going to take 
our roller. I've had it in a plastic bag, so I didn't have to wash it out. And we'll get everything going because we've got to move kind of quick. Okay, so we'll bring the mat up here like this. And I want to figure out which side is which. I've got a rough side and a smooth side. The, um, if you get some little kind of raised bumps, sometimes when you paint fabric, you can get that. Just use a sanding disc and sand it down. This side is the smooth side, and interesting, I have more raised bumps on this side than I do on the rough side. I'm not sure why that would be. <clears throat> All right. And you know what? I forgot. I am to be cutting this down, and I didn't do that step yet. All right, the very first thing that I'll do is I'll mark with white on my um, on my piece and I'm using the Ghost Rider, the Triple Threat Ghost Rider. It has a white lead, a gray, oops, a roller ball, and a gray lead, and it's all stored on board. It has an eraser on the back end too. Okay, so I start with my white line <clears throat> and I just mark it where I know I'm gonna wanna be. And then I go with my L square and give myself a straight edge. And I think it's time to change the lead. Yep. Time to refill. Okay. So I'm going to mark that and then I'll continue my line across. And as you can see, my line is not over here. My line kind of cascades down, but I'm not going to care because I'll give myself a straight edge at the top too. And then my final edge will be transferred on by my pattern. So I'll know that I'm going over here, so I'll go ahead and mark that, and then I'll cut. Just what I'll do is I'll cut all four edges with a very sharp scissor or a rotary cutter. All right, so now I've got it cut down. I'm going to go ahead and re-wet it with one coat. This is what's going to get those edges. You don't really have to focus on getting the edges done. They'll, they'll happen as long as you slop over the edge. You don't want to base coat Rocklawn with, um, <clears throat> with a brush. And the reason why you don't want to do that is because it gets on there really thickly. And with a foam roller, you're, you can really press into it, into the, all the fibers. And if you don't um, press it into it and spread it out really well, then what you end up with is really thick, odd rock lawn. Okay, and we don't want that. Okay, so the reason we're re-wetting it is so that we have something for the paint to blend into. And the reason we put a base coat down first, instead of just blending into that, is because when you do the slip slap technique, it tends to um, lift off and expose the color of the underneath surface. So we have to get one dry coat on there before we can go on. Okay, and I'm not really worried about up here at the top, be oops, up here at the top, because that's where things will flop over, but I will have to slip slap this back part, so that'll be the same technique as I'm doing now. <clears throat> get it on there nice and even. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up on the edge of my roller, just a little bit, and I'll blend it in. This is the, the toe of the roller, and this is the heel. We're going to keep the heel clean, okay? And then we're just going to slip slap, we're going to roll or slip slap up through the piece. Okay, we'll just blend that in. Oops. You do want to have this, you want to kind of create a shadow around the scene effect. Okay, so when we're going to flop this thing over right here, then I'm going to need some shadow down behind here. We're going to have that big old snowman tucked in the middle of this. One of the reasons you need to be at least a value 5 on your base coat um, color is so that your um, snowman will show up when we make him a white snowman. Um, if we were on a value 1 or 10, depending on which way you go up and down that um, scale, it's one way or the other. Um, but if you were white and a very light background, then you won't be able to see the snowman very well. Now I'm going to bring this around on the bottom kind of deep because 
I know that my banner is probably going to be a little bit long. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and bring a little bit of this color into the middle. Okay, and then I'll just roll her kind of slip slap around. Okay, now I'm going to dip my toe dirty brush into the Prussian blue. And I'm going to darken areas, light edges. Get some distance. I'm standing up doing this. I'm standing up walking back and forth. My volume is probably doing funny things because of that. Okay, so we'll just deepen here and there. You definitely have to get a little bit of distance back to be able to see what you're doing. I step back every now and again, give it a glimmer. <clears throat> I'm going to put my pinky right down the middle where I know Frosty's going to sit. Underneath here. I'm going to keep that toe, the heel, into the middle. Otherwise you might press it down and then things might get dirty. And... Okay, now I'm going to go back into Ultra Blue Deep. And I'm going to deepen and brighten. Get you on there. I'm liking that. I'm going to get it all the way to the edge. And you want that mottled kind of look. Ah, sending bottles of paint all over the place. Now we're going to pick up our um, number one oval wash. And it's got a tapered edge so that you don't leave blunt lines. I'm going to wet it in the base coat blue. And then I'm going to pick up some white. And then we'll hold on to this puppy. And now I'll start bringing in a little bit of winter swirly stuff. We're just looking for something that's really, 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 really impressionistic. We don't want to get it too white around, um, around the body, but I do want some of this white swirliness here and there. And now I can rub some white in later, so I'm not too worried about getting this all perfect just now. That's the one thing. Um, your paintings can happen in stages. You don't have to get finished with your background right now. You can be, you know, getting close, and that'll be okay. I think that's the big mistake people make. I will always go back and retouch highlights and shades at the end to make sure that I have, um, you know, the look that I want. Okay, now I'm going to go back into the Prussian Blue. I'm going to bring that around here and there. So I have this big, wet mess of paints. Okay, now I'm going to pick up Prussian and my other. I can afford to be pretty bold with my darks out here at the edge. I really want that framed in when I get done with the painting. If you were too light, it would kind of just all fade away. I don't want a baby blue banner, you know? <clears throat> Bring that dark up because I'm not sure how long my banner's going to be. Not really sure what's going to happen at the bottom of this banner yet. Got my drawing, so I know like what's going on it. I don't know how I'm going to finish the bottom. Got a couple of thoughts. Okay, see how that's getting kind of stormy and and stuff. If I wanted to settle that down a little bit, I would just go back in with very gentle pressure, and I would start working it together. Okay. Now in this area, I wouldn't walk up with my dirty brush. I would wipe my brush out and neutralize it with a little bit of this lighter color. And now I can go back up in there and play around. Okay. <clears throat> I think we're getting there. All right, 
So I think, do you see the fading and everything? And so now to get an idea of what, I don't have my snowman um, traced yet. To get an idea, he'll be sitting in there and they'll all be sitting on this very dark background. And yeah, I think that'll probably work. Okay, so now I let this dry and then I do the same treatment down here on the blue and I do the same thing on my um, my paper towel hider. All right, while things are still wet, I've got a damp sea sponge and I'm going to come into the, pa the palette and I'm just gonna put a little bit of desert turquoise with my sea sponge and watch what I'm doing with my hand. I'm tapping really kind of loosely but I'm also going to start spinning. Pick up a little bit, scant, 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 pound it off if you get too much. Got a paper towel. And bring in Indian turquoise as well. Now I can go with the side of my um, sponge. I always want to call everything a brush. And I can just give a little texture to that outer part and then walk in and blend that just a little bit. I don't want it to look polka dotty. Okay, so now we've got a, like a wintry scene. Like it. And do the same thing to the banner. Okay, we're going to use, I cut my um, graphite paper just a little bit small. I don't like to get like heel prints on my projects. And I always start tracing up at the top. And I always use worn out graphite paper. Okay, I'm going to use the triple thread again. This has got a roller ball inside. Um, it's just like a pen without ink. And it just glides along wonderfully smooth. And because this has got a padded grip, this makes this your tracing best friend. You would not believe how much happier that makes me. I usually get really, really, really like fatigued. My hand gets really tired because I do like a death grip on, on my pencils or pens. Okay, and then I always go in and check to make sure it's dark enough. If it's not dark enough, then I press just a little harder or find a newer sheet of graphite paper. So just a couple of tips for easier tracing. And then you're not going to do, and it took me like three years to learn this, you're not going to do your top details. So I wouldn't do my face yet because I have to base coat all over this, okay? I wouldn't put my stripes in yet because I have to base coat that. So you always just do like the outside shapes, and then you're going to fill those in. And then we'll put the details on top, which is always the fun stuff. And I've got my um, pattern all base coated. Okay, and now I've got a couple of raised little areas. I'm going to be doing some dry rubbing on this. So what I'll do is I'll just do just like I would on wood. And I'll just sand lightly to knock anything back so that I get a nice even um, dry rubbing. Okay, we need a dry paper towel. I'm going to start with our little snowman body. Um, and what I normally do is I normally work on my highlight areas first, so the center areas, because then when you shade and you bring that shading out, the, it lays over the highlights. So that gives you a good, um, if you shaded first and then highlighted and got any highlights into it, you wouldn't get a good layer. So we want that nice layering kind of effect. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to take a giant size, the biggest size of the crescent brush. Okay, and we're going to get out our paints. I've got slight organization going on here. We're going to use three colors. We're base coated in the slate gray, so we're going to use um, gray sky and white as well. Okay, and we'll go ahead and put those colors out. Start with gray sky. We need a dry brush. This is, whoops, that's a nice sound. Um, we dry rubbing is the one where you're going to do like a rouging type effect where you just scumble. Your brush has got to be dry and your paint has to be dry and your surface has to be dry. So, I'm going to rub all the paint off that we can on the paper towel so that when we set it down in the middle it won't um, it won't make us a, a strong start mark. Okay, and I want to go ahead with my triple thread. I've got the white lead out. I want to go ahead and give myself that line. We're going to be creating roundness here. I'm, my scent, my light source is hitting this side of my snowman. So I want the brightest areas to be like over by where his face is. So I'll start off center. And so I'm doing a light scumbly. You can see that just initial set down. 
and then I'll get bigger and bigger and then you can do you know stuff like that now what happens when you get that it's actually not a problem you want to rub a little bit harder on your paper towel to avoid that but later I um, actually will go in and make some texture so that's actually not going to be a problem but if it was something you wanted to have disappear then what you could do is go back to the slate gray color and scumble on top of that okay so now we just keep loading and I'll show you one section of the snowman and then I'm not going to repeat the same technique on the top and the bottom so we're just using um, gray sky and we're dry rubbing and I'll make sure I'm dried off sometimes if this gets kind of cold and feels a little wet you might go ahead and move to your other section move up here get a coat on and then come back down here um, that way you move around and it keeps your gives your paint time to dry okay so notice that I'm going out towards my edges but I'm not going to make this be really bright out here but to show roundness we have to show a graduation of color and you know what's really fun is you wouldn't think that this brush would be able this is the crescent brush you wouldn't think that this brush would be able to um, to make roundness because it's so skinny and that's what I love about it is it's so versatile I can do skinny stuff with this brush or I can do this great big section right here Um, these brushes can also make, we're going to use them on, on the bunny's tail and we're going to stipple with them so they can also make some fur. So they, they make shading and highlighting real easy. They're a very versatile brush. This is one of those times where it's like the boring technique because you just kind of have to build it up. I want this area built up to the color that um, is about the color it is so I want it to look like gray sky in that area and then I'll hit it with the blow dryer and then I'll move to white <clears throat> but it is literally just a layering process so see how we are getting a little roundness but it's not moving very quick okay and it's getting cold so I'm gonna go ahead and do these two to this level and then I'll bring you back. In this area down here, I want to address that you would make sure um, to go right through the bunny's lantern. You don't want there to be bad lines. And in this case, I would go right through the bunny's hand as well. Um, you don't want to try to stop around it because what will happen is you'll get a halo effect of dark. <clears throat> and we can just easily patch the base coat. And you might think, well, I'll just wait to base coat. But you know what? i got to say, it's really, really handy to kind of clump your, your tasks. I want my base coating done so that I can just go marching forward in the fun stuff, which is this stuff. This is just, like, awesome. Base coating is pure drudgery. Okay, so I'll go back and put another coat. I can go a little bit stronger now. And notice that my brush is like fine. It's not like wearing off or doing any kind of weird. Um, you'd think it'd be falling apart with as much abuse as I give it, but it they last and last. Okay, so I'm going to continue. to build this up and I will bring you back when I am at a level that I like and I'll bring you to white. I did two more layers and I've got it to this color. Keep in mind that we're going to want to keep his face brightest then more bright and less bright or not more bright but brightest, less bright, least bright. <clears throat> now dirty brush I'm just going to switch right over to white. I hit it with the blow dryer Okay, and now I'll be a little bit more gentle the first time coming in with the white. And then I won't take it out as far. Okay, so we build our highlight area. I might not, you know, swing out that far. So a lot to actually learn on this uh, little snowflake body. I was playing around with the, um, with the, um, 
paper towel holder and when I was doing my shading I played around with a whole bunch of different um, methods of how to shade and get it big enough and kind of brought it down to one easy way to do this big round shape um, and I'll show you that when we get to the shading part. Okay, we'll just repeat to build. All right, I have got them up to about the area where I think that I need to now add my texture. I'm going to go into the dry rub brush, the same brush. I'm going to wipe it off without rubbing it all off. And now I'm going to look for some crisscrossy kind of texture in the brightest area. And that will just lay it on top a little bit better. But if I tried this too early, then it would be very, very harsh and it would not look good. I'm just get a little bit more of a slip slapped kind of thing, not leaving too many holes or anything. Yeah, that's a little better. See how that's just a little bit kind of textury. It'll add to a flaky look. So I'm using this more as a as a filbert brush right now than I am. So what happens there? I've got that big blob right there. Okay, well, I'm going to just knock it back in just a second. I'll show you. It happens to everybody, and what the difference between um, panic and not panic is what we need to remember. So it's just paint, and it can be frustrating, but you can just go back a step. That's all you got to do is go back one step, and you'll have it. And so I'm working dirty brush, so I'm not going to go back my step just yet. Let's see if we can't marry that in. Okay, now we've got a little bit of scratches out there. Just see how, if that doesn't have the supporting under color, that, that doesn't work so well. So you've got to make sure you have rubbed on some of that other supporting color. Just getting it a little bit spread around, paying close attention to our highlight areas. Okay, I think I'll carry that out just a little bit further. All right, so we have face strongest, neck strongest, and least strongest. Okay, and we probably could bring this up just a little bit more in the middle. We don't want him to look like he has a point on his belly. But that just gives him that kind of that's where you're going to be looking at him. Okay, so if I wanted to fix that, I'll show you how I would. I would dry off my brush. I would go back one color, which would be into the gray, and I would tickle that down. Okay, so if I had an area, like maybe we'll call this spot right here, you can just tickle it back just a little bit, and then it fades it down. You can do that until you like what you see. Okay, but don't futz too much because by the time we get done, we smush and wiggle and plop and we do all kinds of stuff to this poor snowman. All right, one of the things that we get um, questions about all the time is, well, how do you clean this brush? Because now I've got a ridge of white and colors built up, and this is not the appropriate color to demonstrate with because I'm on white. But we're going to use the Brush Cleaner and Restore. This is worth every penny that you pay for it because it's only like six bucks for a jar of the stuff but it will remove dried paint out of any of your brushes so I'll go here and like I said it's not a good example except for look what's coming out have you seen me use any yellow with it no okay so that's from another project okay and that was dried up in there so in addition to the white yep, and there's a new color being released it's a darker color and of course that makes sense because it would be, um, I love this basin right here because it allows you to um, hold that liquid and really just kind of work it into your brush. Now you can come up here and kind of tease through. You don't want to go like that. This um, stuff is just, I don't know, it's amazing. It will save your brushes. Okay, so I don't know how many times you've ever left a brush and it had dried paint in it. I've got one actually, you know what? I over here on the floor. 
on the floor by the trash can. I saw it yesterday afternoon and it is hard. I can it can bend only the tips of the bristles. And it is and oh I can if I push it I can really bend it. Okay. So watch. There we go. Look at that green paint. So it fell on the floor, probably had paint in it. Okay, and that was totally dried paint. Dried, you didn't even see that brush laying there. So I don't know how many times that's happened to you, but this is brilliant stuff. You wash it out with water. Make sure you rinse off the, the thing here. Um, funny story, I had not rinsed this off. I set it aside after I got done because I was filming. And so I just pushed it aside and then the paint dried. And it was dried on there. And I thought, oh no, you know, I've ruined it or whatever. And so I went into the bathroom with a scumbly brush. I just dumped some of my brush cleaner and restorer on that and just rubbed it right off. So, I mean, it just takes paint off of things. Your clothes, just do a test um, on an area. Okay, now we'll wash this brush out. If you get paint on your clothing. Okay, now let's see what we got here. All right, yeah. So now we have our brush back. It's all restored. And that is, I don't know, maybe a $9 brush. And guess what? I can use this brush for five years, you know, when I might have been trashed before. And I have never seen another brush cleaner that actually works. Um, most brush cleaners kind of work. This, or this really, really works. All right, this is, okay, I really, really played quite a bit with this. Because if you have a great big brush, let's go with our big flat, I can do a float here, but the flat brushes like to leave like little corners on things. I don't like that. So I prefer not to use that, and it's difficult for a lot of people to handle. We need to, we need to float to get right up next to our edge, so that's fine, but it's going to be stripy and small. Okay, so I played with curved flats. I played with my um, brights. Um, I played with a whole bunch of different ways of laying down the paint. And one of the things that was really helpful is putting your water drops out on your palette. Okay, and so see how they grow as you keep squirting? That's going to allow us to keep our brush at exactly the right amount of water. And then the other thing that you can do is you can use extender. So I've got extender. These are my little travel things. I've got alcohol, um, water. I don't know if you've ever done alcohol um, misting on a wash before, but it makes the paint all go out like that. It's awesome. So you want to have just a little bit of that um, extender. You could put the brush cleaner into it. It doesn't mind. The plastics don't mind that on this um, um, mist, misting bottle. Sorry. So I'm going to put out a little bit of extender. And I'll show you a couple of techniques. So just squirt that onto the palette. Okay, you don't want to mix your extender and your water. So I'm going to show you down here on this bottom one. Um, extender and water tend to make things sticky. Okay, so we'll brush on a nice sheer coat of extender around Mr. Bunny. Okay, a little bit more. Oops, that's water. Make sure you check which way the holes are pointing so you don't squirt yourself in the face. I've done that before. With the extender, it's really important that you brush both ways, up and down and side to side, so that you work the extender into the pores of your surface. Okay, and I'll just go ahead and do this whole base. Here, you don't want a dry area. You want to bring the extender out further than you think you're going to need to. And this is just drying time extender by DecoArt. Um, excellent, excellent. Um, you can mix it in with your paints. Um, make it be a little bit more oil painty. Okay, now I can use this brush to um, so I can use the drying time extender then I can use this oval glaze to put some paint down. Okay, now what I would do is I would go I would just go ahead and put my paint right where I wanted it. and then bring it out just a little bit. Just like if I was pretending like I was going to be able to float that far. Go back, pick up a little bit more. 
going to be paying attention to your chiselly edge there. And now here at the bottom, we're going to want our shading. I got a little bit sloppy with how much extender is still left on the surface. Um, we need a paper towel. I'm going to get a clean one. And now I'm going to go into this and I'm going to mop right at the edge. Get all my edges done. Okay. And then got a little bit of a shine going on too. And then I can start walking towards the wall, if you will. And then I can walk it out too. And if you need to nudge something, don't be afraid to get in there. And then when you pick up too much, just wipe it off on your paper towel. So how non-messy and fun was that? That was like absolutely not threatening. Got a little bit of a halo going on. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to do our skinny float and we're not going to worry about it. So, you know, if you think that extender is just for artists, you know, we are artists. We just happen to use a pattern and that's the only difference. And guess what? Most artists use patterns. Um, very, very few artists just go, hey, I'm just going to like start slapping paint on this canvas, you know. They have a thumbnail, they have a sketch. You know, the difference is, I guess, that they drew the sketch instead of borrowing it from someplace else. A lot of times they borrow from someplace else too, but that's another whole story. Okay, so I want this to come in further. Okay, so I'm just going to lay that down, make it near Bunny's face, make it in Bunny's face, okay, darker down here, and I want that to be rounder out here, okay, we'll go in, do it a little bit darker over here. And now I'll go in. So isn't that fun? You just like lay it down there. Like cool. All right. Clean area first. I can walk in and out of my clean area to kind of manage things around. Notice I'm not worrying about Bunny's little hand. It's just a little base coat. Wipe it off. Sometimes you might need to go find a wet spot on a paper towel like over here and then wipe it dry. See how it's just kind of softly dirty. All right, and now I'm going to even this out. And that's just going to be a light tap. I don't want to pick up all the paint. And I'll just keep walking back to even out. And one thing that you want to do is you want to keep a thing of Q-tips. These are super duper, look at, they look like little missiles. Um, super duper sharp and pointy and hard Q-tips that you can kind of keep reusing and using. Get it off of your snow on the bottom. If you happen to get anything messy, just wipe it off. That's the other beauty of Extender is it allows you to um, go clean off your mistakes. Just make sure you extend out a little bit, otherwise it'll be stuck on there. Okay, let's see. Leaning back a little bit. To see where I've got. And look at like my shading is just about done. Now, is that the easiest thing you've ever tried? It's just amazing. Okay, I'm gonna wet, I'm gonna I'm on a wet part of my paper towel and I'm gonna come over here and dry. Wet part, dry. So I can continue. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit the blow dryer, but in the meantime, I don't want to waste your time, my time, things like that. I want to show you another way. So I'll wash my brush, and now I don't want to be, like here's, I've got wet stuff. I don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time on the blow dryer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in my, my bridge. Okay, this is just an acrylic bridge with, um, with what do you call them, um, feet. And it can span 
across my whole project. So now I'll show you that other technique. All right, so we've got everything on camera. The very first thing we want to do is we want to talk about the brush. It's a curved flat, so it has that curved flat. It has um, a flat side and a round side, and it is great for doing stroke work. Um, just, it does everything, I swear. It's just like a magic brush. Okay, so I'm going to load the flat side, and I'm going to blend. Now watch the time that I save by having these little water droplets out here. This is a really big area, and I am going to really struggle with um, keeping my brush moistened enough to keep the water floating. So I'm going to go in there, I'm going to walk up to my edge. Painting on Rockland can be a little bit different. I've got to kind of massage the color in sometimes, get it started. I'm not worried about his shoulder. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead, get it next to my edge. I'm going to walk it in just a little bit. Go out with my trusty dusty mop and go ahead and smooth it out. Always wipe your mop off right away. Now this is the point where, now see I have a giant ridge of color right there. This is the point where I might normally go rinse, 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 blot, reload, load some water, blot, re, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, I don't want to. So I'm just going to go and choose the size of water droplet that I think I need. I'll go back to my original floating spot and I will re-blend. I might touch on the paper towel to pre prevent any, you know, excess stuff. And then I'm going to come over here and massage it in. Remembering we're on thirsty, thirsty canvas. Canvas just is always thirstier. I'm going to kind of stay away from my edge too much down here where I have the retarder. Now, notice exactly what I said was going to happen is happening. I'm getting stripy because I can't get, these brushes only come so big. And um, people don't seem to manage big brushes. But what I'm doing is I'm just getting my edge shading done. Pick up another water droplet, come back over here. I might even go on the other side to squeeze some of that in. And then I'll come up and I think I'll flip him around. Okay, and we'll continue on our journey to mark our borders. This is the same first initial load of paint that I did. It is the only time my brush was in that water bucket was when I started. I'm going to load another drop of water. I like to do that. If you make the slurping sound, it's much more fun. Okay, so this is saving me so much time and effort. I haven't spent all my time washing my brush. I haven't made a bunch of mess on my paper towel, and I'm still using the same um, blending strip from my palette. So I'm not using up my whole palette either. I remember when I first started painting, I would have big, long blending strips, and then every time that I would, um, every time that I would blend that color again, I would move to another spot and another spot, and I'd have one color, and it would take up the whole pad. Okay, so we're flipping that back around, and now I do need to reload. Do I have to go wash my brush? No, because I'm still getting a clean thing. So I'll load some water. Blot, that was a little too much. And then I'll come onto my same spot. I didn't have to wash my brush. Yay! Okay, and now we're just going to go ahead and continue. If you get nothing else out of this video than that, I think it will make you a very happy person. Okay, so why aren't I afraid of making any corners or making um, any stripes? Okay, let me show you. I am going to have to hit the blood dryer. I'm going to go ahead and shade his, um, his head up here and get that done. And then I'll come back. This will be dry. And then I can show you why I'm not afraid of stripes and things. I'll bet you I can do the whole snowman's head without ever washing this brush as well. Alright, I did get by with just using the same load, and now I'm finally going to wash this. At this point, this would be a really good time for me to wash my mop brush, because the paint is still fresh, um, and so that means I'll be able to get it out with water. Otherwise, I would use my brush cleaner on this, and these are just such good... Notice how much shorter these bristles are than your normal, um, and they're also tapered. 
and they're very stiff but very soft. They do a really awesome job of blending. So I'll just rinse that out because it'll take forever to dry. <clears throat> Make sure I'm drying it out as much as I can and then lay it off to the side to finish drying and in the meantime I'll use different size mops um, to get where I need to go. We're going to get into our crescent brush again and this is the secret weapon. Let me make sure I'm going to hit that with the blow dryer. It's got to be completely dry. All right, I'm going to use graphite in my dry crescent brush. And I'm going to come out over here. And remember, we're not worried about his arm. I'll come out from everywhere where I've got that shading that was liney and stripy. And I'm just going to scumble it out. This is such a great cheater technique. You just need to shade or float to get near your edge and then you can come in and you can draw out your um, float as far as you want to with just scribbling. What I love about this is this is so easy that even small children can do it. You know, you don't have to, floating is, so uh, starts with a certain letter of the alphabet and it makes more painters nuts, I think, than any technique because it does require, it took me two years I painted um, as a business even, like I started to paint to sell and painted hundreds of repeat items and it took me two years to figure out how to float. But boy, the day I got it, I had a Snoopy dancing party. Okay, so see how I'm drawing that out? Now I don't have to worry about lineys and stripies. I can go back over here and I can deepen. and just feather it out. Okay, so now we've got a little bit, so this is kind of in there where it doesn't, where I don't like it. So we just will scumble that down. If we need a smaller area done, we can go in and we can make it, um, we can make it a little bit more, um, you can use a smaller brush, sorry. Sometimes the hardest thing for me to do is keep my mouth going and my hands painting at the same time. I'm glad I'm not chewing gum right now. Okay, so I'll just drag that over there. And we don't want it to get too dark. We don't want him to be, he's a little bit of a, kind of a chimney sweep looking snowman until we get some purples on him. Okay, so I think dark enough. Now this is still drying. I did hit it with a blow dryer, but I don't want to spend a lot of time. I'm going to go in here and just deepen that with a little bit of a dry rub. I could have laid down more paint, but the, the idea was is I was showing you how to do the shortcut and I'll still need to do my float. Actually, I could do that now. <clears throat> okay, so load. And I can go right up over here and just cinch that into its corners. Okay, and that's what I'll do is I'll just finish cleaning up my edges. One of the things that I'm, I'm kind of chuckling about is um, I'm so happy to have this bridge. Um, it really, besides also making my strokes looser, it just allows me to go and move around in this area where I've got this wet medium outside of here, and it allows me not to have a care in the world about it. So I can also, whoa, look at that. Okay, that's what fingers are for. Okay. I'll go in there and just straighten that out. I can walk it out and then I can go into my smaller mop. And I can clean it up. So see how that's taking care of this little halo edge. When you try these um, curved flats for walking color out, you are going to be impressed. Um, they really, really, because it's rounded on that far edge, they really do a great job. Okay, and I have one last little place. Okay, I've got my white Ghost Rider, and I want to put my line up here. While we have these colors out, we're going to switch to the smaller crescent brushes. And so we'll just get out the, and they make them really, Mike, this one even smaller than this. 
let's do hats. Little snowman hats. So we want to go into, they're base coated with graphite. The hats base coated with graphite, so we want to go back one color to slate gray. Can do it. Alright, we're just gonna dry rub the highlights with slate gray. And so we want to keep this movement going up and down. Let's get you in a little closer so you can keep my head out of that picture. Okay, so I'm going to hold this down. You do some pretty big, you do want to keep it out of the hat um, top. But you can bring it around quite a bit. And go from side to side to straighten it out just a little bit. I like the up and down movement. Those um, beaver skin hats were quite um, shiny. So I like the idea of there being a little bit of a sheen on my hat. I keep forgetting I'm painting on rock lawn. And it moves around a little bit because it's so lightweight. The neat thing about painting on Rockland too is the storage. You can hang your banners with pants hangers or skirt hangers in the closet and then just, you know, take them out for the season or whatever. Now I'm going to move from this area because I need to switch color. And I'm going to go ahead and do shape following. Highlight over here. Like that's going back around that corner. Just give it a little bit of dance around the brim. I'm hoping this technique is seeming really, really simple to you because this is super friendly. If you haven't tried it, I encourage you to give it a shot. Okay, so we'll bring that around and we'll make it wider. Sometimes we make it wider to be able to support the next color because if it's really narrow, um, that's not going to do you any good when you want to get another color on there. I'm going to keep our highlight on our hat up near the front and it's going to fade back. And then we might go shape following that way too. I'm going to switch into the gray sky, dirty brush. And now Build that highlight in the front. And we'll build the other highlights. All of their hats are going to be the same. You're just going to want to look to see where your strength of color, remember your center of interest, um, is going to determine. This little bunny down here has to be slightly more retired than the bird because the bird's in that first initial interest place. And I don't mind this getting a little stripey right here. That makes me happy, so I'm trying for that. Gray sky. Okay, remember, squint your eyes at it to see if you're getting, keeping things where they belong in that center of interest. If you're not keeping the center of interest protected, you might end up with a big white spot on his hat and everybody's eye might go there first. Kind of chuckling a little bit in my head because eventually I put a big white spot right there. But I lead it along with the, um, the fairy dust or the magic dust. Now I'm into white. I'm going to bring that little bit of a shinier shine to the very front. I can go into my red, that's not a problem because I can just go fix that. A little bit of shiny shines. Notice I spend a lot less time. Okay. I might want to go one more time with very strong. And that gives it a good I am the middle line, the master of this hat kind of moment. Now you'll repeat on the other guys and do the same thing just with smaller brushes. Alright, next 
we'll go ahead and we'll use our curved flat and we'll use lamp black and we're going to shade our hats. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead. Just shade away. Got a little drop of water right there. You always want to blot. Remember, we're picking up water from over here. Just want to blot on your um, paper towel after you blend your float. Okay, so that just makes it so any extra little bits of things that shouldn't be there aren't. So notice I'm just kind of chopping at this and watch what I do next. I'm just going to go through and smooth it and curve it. There we go. And one super, super duper secret thing. If you blot on a wet area, it will grab the water um, a little bit better. So you actually spend a little bit less time blotting and more time painting. If I could stay within the lines, that'd be great. Pick up paint. You know, notice that I am trashing this brush and look at how nice and chiselly it is. Is I don't know what they did when they designed this brush, but they did something right. Okay, come over here. That just gives a nice depth. Go there with the rounded side and clean that up. And then just walk that paint right on out. Okay, we'll make a hat top and a bottom. And we need to give it sides. Let's see where else we're at. Okay, we can do the little birdie's hat while we're waiting. for things to dry so you just walk yourself around um, your project. You need to give just a little chiseling float. Good strong darkness right under there. Chisely. So I'm backing it up with my finger. Okay, rather than switching to another size brush, I could do the same thing on the top just to indicate an edge. Like that that hat band is maybe fuzzy or raised just a little bit. Grab this back side over here. Okay. I'm going to have to hit the blow dryer. I'm not getting very far very fast. So when you have all these corners right here, when this one goes to here and this one goes to here, these two have to be dry before you cut through them or you'll remove part of the float and it looks really bad. And I'm patching my colors and I wanted to share with you, I'm using the Easy Stroke brush to base coat with. I base coated big things, not the snowman, but everything else I base coated with the Easy Stroke. I'm going to get some green. Notice on my palette, I'm just going to come over here and I'm just going to flat into the color. And notice what happens, my Easy Stroke stays chisely, chisely, chisely flat and it still isn't. Even with me pushing against it, it still isn't collapsing back to a round brush. It's a perfectly wonderful flat brush. If I reshape it, now it's a round brush. Oops, can you see? So if I want it just a little bit flat, now it's a little bit flat. If I want it to be big flat, okay, now it's big flat, okay? I can dry brush with them. A little bit more paint here or I can base coat with them, okay? I can reshape it and I can make perfect strokes. Okay, so this brush is your best friend. All right, so I'm making it a flat right now. So I'll just come over here and I'll chisel in and rebase the details that I had lost earlier with my floats and then rebase coat this one, which only got one coat. You know, always give us feedback. If you find um, 
I don't know, I, I've been told that the details are good, so people like to hear why, why they're doing things. So do let me know if you appreciate that or not, because it helps me make better films, better videos for you. Okay, so we just go back and fix anything that got messed up. I'll fix the bunny. And ta-da, presto, your, all your um, shading didn't have to worry about that, but it only takes just seconds to patch those paints. All right, we're bringing it a little bit closer, and we'll work on some of these other details. I realized that I had painted some of my reds with the wrong reds, so I'm rebase coated, and now I can keep working even though this is wet um, by having my bridge. Okay, so I'm going to dry brush. Now, dry brushing is different than dry rubbing. I'm going to use my um, Easy Stroke brush. I'm just going to load some generous paint in it. Okay, and flatten it. I'm going to flick on my paper towel. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to anchor myself. Okay, and I'm just going to use gentle pressure and it will make a gentle highlight. Kind of scratchy, a little bit. Um, reload to the tip, flick. I can bring that all the way out to the tip there. This doesn't have to be smooth. The more painterly it is, the better off you're going to like it. Okay, so we'll come back over here. Yeah, that's not showing up, but that's okay, we'll brighten it. Now we'll just come on down to Mr. Bunny. I wonder if his name is Fuku, huh? I've got a monitor that I'm supposed to use to keep myself on camera, and it was half covered up by the napkin holder. Okay, so just do some highlights. Now this is a little bit different because it's a really large area. So we're just going to do our highlight and then walk it down. Okay, it's just very strokish. Okay, not quite base coat, but not quite whatever else. I love that you can just keep rotating the, the banner. This is a really big piece to paint, and a lot of you will find it frustrating um, if you don't have space for it. So by being able to slide it under your arm, that helps so much, and I can actually slide it over the edge of the table. Another technique for these long ones like this is to come up here and just roll roll up the areas, whoops, roll up the areas that you're not using and keep it like that. that. Makes it a little bit shorter. Now I'll wipe off my brush and dirty brush go into the sour apple. Fleck on the paper towel and we'll highlight the highlights. Okay. I walked into another color. It's important that you flick when you're first starting. Okay, and sometimes this can get a little bump, like when I just started rolling it, I'm getting a little raised edge, so I'm going to flatten it there. Because wherever it's raised, that's where it'll get the most attention. Okay, see how nice and dry and scratchy? That's what dry brushing means. It means dried and scratchy looking. It's actually a trick um, from the old masters. That's what they used to do. And it's one of the ways that you can make your projects look the most blended because it's like a bunch of little hairs. When you look at your hair, they're all microscopically skinny hairs, but you can't see through to the back of your head unless your hair is really thin. But the same thing with this is by having all of the streaks it allows the color under it to show, and that allows things to look more blended, unless you're looking for something that's not very, very blended. Like in this case, I want a little bit more painterly look, so I want it unblended. And a bit more up there. Okay, we're going to shade with evergreen. Okay, and that's just going to be right over. 
And you'll note how, um, I need a little bit more paint, you'll note that by floating right over some of your highlights, that's what gives it a good blended look. Flip our brush over, give it a blend. I'll walk this in just by walk, walk, walk. Okay, I come up and under, across. And notice I'm not adding more water. This is a very transparent color. And if I add water, it's going to be more transparent. I want it to lay down on the surface. Okay, and that will make me happier. overall effect. Okay. I think we can go one more step up to black green. All right, we're going to deepen with black green. Very little water because I just want just the little little edge of things happening. I don't want it to come in too far. The smaller you want to float, notice I haven't changed um, to a small brush. Um, that is completely unnecessary. You just load less paint. I'll load just a little bit of water. Okay, and we'll decide where this is dry or not. This one is not. A little shade across here. Wherever things are hanging over other things, that's where you shade. Now in this case, this is shaded, but I want to make this nice lovely V down here. So I'll just cut the corner because I can with this brush. Same thing over here. I want that top corner shaded, but I don't really want it floated straight. I just want the corner done. See, because it's got just that little curved back end, I can sneak things into corners. Okay, I like it. All right, now we're gonna shade underneath the snowman's eyes and buttons. So we'll load, um, we'll load graphite for the underneath, and then we're just going to do this drop shadow to the lower left side of his eyes and buttons. his nose. Try to make them all at the same o'clock, if you will. So if everybody's at seven o'clock, um, then you won't have weird things happening with some shadows being at the wrong, the wrong o'clock. Okay, and they have kind of just like a little line at the end, and that's fine. That's how I want them. Well, that's how I want them. You can have them however you want them. Make this one be a little bit bigger. Okay. Oh. Sometimes that little blot with the finger is the most perfect thing. We're going to take black and we're going to shade the buttons and the, all the cold pieces. Okay, so I'll come back up here. What I love, did you notice this is still wet? I can slide this right back under here and get going on it. 
and then one blow dryer stops. Okay, so I'm going to do the opposite o'clock. So I'm going to go in that upper um, 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock kind of area. These can be pretty heavy. So that they show. Alright, next we're going to add our white sparkles to our eyes. And I could wait to do this till the end, but I'm not going to. You want these on the same o'clocks as well. If they're at different o'clocks, then they'll be cross-eyed. And once again, my hand is not running through. I'm going to blot this just a little bit and bring it down to slate gray. So I put white highlights on the eyes, but then as I come down here, I want them to fade a little bit. So I'll do the slate gray. So it's less, you know, in your face. And then maybe I'll blot it with my finger. Wah! Helps if you blot in the same spot. So what do we do about that? Um, we just go back one step. Always back one step. I'll just tickle on some base coat color. All right, next we're going to mix some of our country red and our coral blush together in our brush. Okay, I'll get you over here. So mix them, and we're just going to flatten out our brush nice and big. So some, I'm not knocking other round brushes when I say that um, some round brushes are just not made to lock like these are. Okay, so it's just, they're, it's how the brush is cut. And that's what my job is to do, is to discover brushes that really work really well and do multitudes of things. That way you don't waste your money buying, you know, 29 sets of round brushes. Okay, so we're just going to dry brush. And that's that flicking, not worrying about blending thing in our red areas. And in a way, I'm almost kind of base coating those um, checks <clears throat> a little bit more. And we want to go shape following. So, for example, what I want to be is I want to go up and down because that's like the weave of our fabric. Side to side would be okay, but we're going to go up and down. One thing about the Ghost Rider, I've got Ghost Rider X's on there, is it erases with spit, water, and varnish, so you don't ever have to worry about your lines being trapped on your piece. Super duper awesome. Okay, so... <clears throat> okay, I'm up here on the thing. Let's, this is bigger than the uh, napkin holder, or the paper towel um, hider. Do you love the idea of being able to um, hide your paper towels? I do. Okay, so we're going this direction. Once again, we're not going to worry about his arm. I think I just reversed myself. I think I did. Hmm. So these guys are supposed to go crisscross. <clears throat> now I've just picked up only coral blush. Okay, and I'm going to make that those areas get just slightly smaller and smaller. And I want them rougher and rougher. That's how it's going to look like it's, um, I don't know, just got some nubbiness to it. Okay, I'll go up in this hat. Let's see if that buff bugs me that I flipped that. <clears throat> Bring it out just a little bit wider. Okay. What's interesting is I'm using the exact same set of brushes that I used for the smaller piece. Um, you don't need 
necessarily always to buy different sets of brushes. On the tail, we're going to get, okay, let's see if I can get you so you can see. <clears throat> I'm going to, let's get you a little bit more around. And I, yeah, this is what I don't like about upside right. I just want to flick so that I get some of those um, separated strokes. Okay, and here. If I can be on my bridge, I can be back on my handle a little bit more. I have to paint slightly differently, but... Okay, now on his face, I want to have a highlight in the middle. I'm not going to worry so much about his beaker's eye. Okay, so I can just tickle in highlights. On the belly, I'm, I am going to switch brushes. Now I'm going to pick up just the coral again, one more time, and I'm going to make it stronger. Okay, just getting that kind of fun winter scarf. Have you seen all the scarves that are in the stores? Now we want to make them be highlightier. <clears throat> Up the middle of the scarf area. Alright, now we want to add a stripe. Okay. switch to our dry rub brush for the bird's belly. And keep our fingers out of the paint. And dry rub the highlights on the bird's belly. Repeat. And you could stipple a couple up there too. <clears throat> okay, so we need to brighten up the highlights on our birdie. Our rockin' robin, who is not a robin, she's a ah, cardinal. Okay, so see how I've got that just kind of blobbed in the middle of the face? That is not going to be a problem because I'm going to shade and it's going to soften it all down. And we'll get another highlight up here. And you can even go with just a little bit more white. And then we'll brighten his belly up. I had a phone call interrupt, which meant I had to wash my brush. Which means my brushes are all wet. This, these crescent brushes, you really, really need two or three sets of them because they get, um, if they get wet, you can't use them. And if you're moving through a project at the speed that we're moving through, um, it becomes very difficult to have um, brushes to go through. So you do need a couple sets. But they're so forgiving and they last so long, I don't think you'll be sorry that you put the money in. Now we'll go through and we're going to shade with alizarin crimson. This is a very transparent color. I'm using it for its tonality almost only. It's not going to do a really positive shading job for me, but it will glaze my colors and make them richer looking. So I want it heavy and I want to walk it in. <clears throat> I'll start over here at the edge and I will just walk my way in. Notice that I'm not getting a big shade value, even though the color looks like it's going to be so dark. Okay, just walk it in. You can 
almost wash it over for another good effect. And I'm not using any water as I pick up more paint. Okay, and then we need to shade under and over all of our scarf stuff. Be careful now that things get finished. So like the hat down on the bunny is finished and our belly of our snowman is basically finished. We want to be careful about running through things. So now is when painting gets a little bit more conscious of what's around it. But I've got so much red stuff here to do. I want a little ridge next to his arm. We can go on a belly of our bird. And the tail. Walk that up. Round it out that part I was talking about. Once this glazes that little white area, it'll look perfect. <clears throat> okay, now we gotta go under and over. Still kind of, whoops. I led with the chisel and didn't put the back half of the brush down. It's a little wet in the corner over there. I'll leave that alone for right now. And now we'll do the back sides of Keeping it off of the end of the world here. water drop. I'm not getting flow and so I'm having to scrub at my brush and I don't want to scrub at it. So that's when you pick up one or two little water drops just to get the flow that you need. Okay, I have one more to add. face. I've left the final highlight out for um, for the end. And that way, if we glaze over everything, then um, we will have, we'll be able to add the highlight back on. Okay, next is going to be into black plum. This can be floated like with water instead of just like solid, like I did the last one. <clears throat> okay, and we'll start wherever things are dry. And we won't walk it out as far. Just a little bit of walking out. Okay, that gives us a nice... I'm painting by reversing my brush right now, more so that um, convenience of filming. And that's a really awkward thing. You always want your brush to be pointing towards you so that you can see what you're doing. You want to see what your paintbrush is actually doing. I just don't always have that luxury when I'm painting on camera. <clears throat> okay, we'll come over here, a skinny over that way, and we'll make a fat wedge down here at the bottom. It's a big old bird. And now see, I've got a little bit of a line going in the middle. I'll just use the belly of the brush or the other curved edge of that brush to make it To, to blend it out. Okay. And we'll just keep walking around. This is all repeat, so I'm gonna 
leave you and finish it and I'll be back when I'm done. I'm going to start with our highlights. We're going to put coral blush and just not cover everything that was there before, but just give it the highlight up the middle, crossing the boundary between the shading. Okay, so that's going to be like just in the centers too. And I am going to change the direction that that's going in on the scarf. It didn't bother me until just then because I want to go from shade to the highlight and I can't do that unless I make it right. And now just a little bit of white mixed in with that. And let's keep this in the center of interest. Okay, so we don't want this everywhere. But up here where the action is, I need a little bit of tint color. This is coming up chalky. And if it looks like it was on a chalkboard, it's too, too bright. Okay, we'll keep that like that. And we'll add just a little bit more of a highlight on his hat band. All right, I've got milk chocolate to shade our orange twist noses. I did want go down one brush size. Just for giggles. Now we need to shade along the bottom of the nose. And we can shade along the bottom of the beak. If you let just that brush lead, it'll suck right into that corner where you want it and not make things bad. Okay. Now figure out how to... Yeah, that's not going to work. Okay, I want to go upside down, so I'm going to blend my brush on the far side because I want there to be like a little line for the carrot ridges. There we go. And the beak only needs rounding out just a little bit. See what I forgot? My nose will not look sunk if I don't shade next to it. And I didn't do that on my other piece. Okay, now we also want to shade where the arms are coming out and under <coughs> with graphite. Okay, and that will just give that, that shaded look. Okay, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but I have a kind of a grand scheme of attack here. I'm attacking everything by color. So what was white got to be um, white, and I dealt with it. What was black got to be dealt with. Now I'm going into my browns. We did all the reds together. Um, and that just makes it a little bit easier and faster to paint. I'm not about speed necessarily. I mean, I'm kind of lying. Um, I'm kind of about speed. But what I want is to work effectively so that I can paint the next thing. I don't want to spend eight years on this project because there's 800 things I want to paint. All right, so we're taking our little liner brush and the same round brush, not liner. And I think I'm going to skip Coco and go into Camel on the middle of his arms because it's just not showing up. I'll flick on the paper towel so I get a nice round look here. And branch out. Okay, and that's just going to help me highlight. It'll be less highlighted down here where it's behind his body, and more so out here on the tip of his finger. You can go back and do it again if you want. I 
His arms are kind of secondary, but we need them to show up because they are like little place markers. They are action points. You can mix just a little bit of white in with your cocoa and do the parts that you really want to show up. I think this is important over here by his face. Maybe that beating elbow. The bunny's going to be done the same way, but I think I just want to deal with the arms first. Come to me. All right. We'll go into our um, curved flat. And we'll start out with um, dark chocolate. And we're going to do some walking. Okay. So we'll get it up next to where we want it, really nice and pretty. And then we'll start walking our way back. Okay. And we're going to deepen that, so we've got one more step to do. Stay off the snowman. You notice our snowman looks a little dirty but I have a surprise. We are going to brighten his little tushy up. <clears throat> I'm still using the same Q-tip. They just last and last. You can let them dry if you don't mind the fact that you've been spitting on it, and you can use it again for the next project too. They just kind of have a good, a good way that they go. They dry up really nice. And then they're just as good as new. So don't throw them away. <clears throat> so I'm going to just shade the edges of that. And I will go ahead and finish the rest of the arms and bring you back for the next shadow color. Okay, we have the bunny to, to deal with. We're going to start with Coco. He's based with um, milk, honey brown. So we're just going to start a series of dry rub things here. Float to, I think we can probably skip to, uh, to camel. If you have a really heavy hand, start with the other color. Okay, so we're just going to start giving the bunny some features. Highs and lows. The, the highlights will be the highs. Okay, so we'll just highlight, highlight, dry rub at the middle of his ear, because he'll be shaded on either side. And this little paw. He's got a little arm here. Anything there's, where there's a muscle, if you think about it that way. Oops. Switch to a bigger brush. And we'll see if that'll matter. By the time we get shaded, I suspect it won't. <clears throat> running out of dry spots. The one thing about this technique is it does eat up your paper towels. We could make his toes be really bright. And then repeat all the all of that again. So now I got a little bit 
on my scarf. I'll just go with my Q-tip and I'll clean it off. Pretending like it's not there. It's easier if you have a sharp little tool to take it off. I'm going to mix just a little bit of white with my um, camel color. And just scribble up. middle of those. Okay, so for Bunny's tail, we're going to use this brush and we're going to um, stipple with some milk chocolate. Right out, and we want to hit over the edge to give it a furry look. So I've just got one half of my brush loaded, just that half. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and stiffle with some cocoa. And then we're going to shade next to this. I probably jumped the gun on this. Just to give him a little furry bun. I'm going to dry rub in the bunny's ear with some white <clears throat> and cocoa. Nope, camel. And you can even go in there with a little bit of coral plus a little bit of your camel. If need be, you could add some white. Let's give that little ear a pink tinge inside. All right, now let's shade our little bunny. Every time I say our little bunny, I want to say foo foo. <clears throat> so we're going to go, let's try him with the, um, just the, which color is it? Dark chocolate. Let's see how we do. So we'll shade under his hat rim, next to his ear, like that little corner. Yeah, we'll definitely need to do some deepening. And then where we hit corners, we want to round it out. That's The way you do that is you lean towards the back. So instead of being straight up and down, you lean it backwards. And that will allow you to round your corners because you'll be leaning on the, um, the round side of the, the curved flat. This really isn't, um, it's not a fake, how cool is this brush? This is a... How cool is this brush? It's just so amazing. Like it is engineered to do stuff I have not seen before. Okay, we'll bring it around the bunny's tail, which is why I jumped the gun. Okay. And we have to do both sides of that, so we'll just go ahead and do that. And I need to switch back to my bigger brush because this is going to be harder. Big brush does your job for you. I can make this brush work, so one brush works fine. Okay. I ran out of water drops, so it's time to put some more out. That is one of the best techniques I have seen ever. Learned it in a painting class. That's why you take classes or watch DVDs and things. Is to learn things that make your painting just easier. <clears throat> okay. back and round that out. <clears throat> what I like about this brush is if you turn it on the chisel you can fit it into pretty small places and 
get your shading all done all at one time without having to wait for a bunch of stuff to dry. Okay, so this is raw. Painting backwards is not always easy. I have to round that out when I get there. The back side of the tail and then underneath the tail. Now notice what you're not hearing is a bunch of clank, clank, clank in the water bucket because you just, it just works. I'll clean my brush five times instead of 55 times. <clears throat> okay, his little face needs... We get to go and deepen things. Are we deep enough? This can come up here. We'll make him just have a fat little belly. Oops. His little backside needs to be. Round our corners. Alright, now we're going into the next color. The next color is. Um, yes, it is the same one we used before, and I can't think of the name. Um, bittersweet chocolate. Now, I don't want bittersweet chocolate bunny. I think he might get a little too dark, so I'm going to just darken some of my corners where things just kind of all come in together. His little hat here back of his head. Give him some deeper areas. Probably his backside. Give him some roundedness over here. more on his face here. On the um, on the other project I didn't have to spend as much time on the bunny because he was small. The bigger you get the harder, not harder, longer things take to paint. I'm going to darken where his eye goes and just kind of have a hint of an eye. And maybe he can have a hint of a little nose, too. Oops. And that's all using the um, Bittersweet. Okay, we want to shade the holly. With evergreen. Yeah, and that's just not going to show up very well. I'll go ahead. You know what I did? I think I base coated. No, I did. I did it right. Okay. Every now and again, we'll just do it stronger. Walk that color out. Getting it really strong in the middle. We'll have to dry that. In the meantime, we're going to go ahead, instead of drying it with the blow dryer, what I'll do is I'll switch to the Chesa fur brush. This is a rake brush, and I don't know if you can see that it's cut into little, um, you have to kind of splay them out to see. So I'm going to come over here on my palette with a little bit of water, and I'm just going to really splay it out. Okay, I'll start with my pinks and reds. I'll move some red into my watery pile here and I'll splay it out really nice 
it's like a bunch of round a bunch of liner brushes all um, all attached okay so now what I want to do is I just want to make some tassels okay and that's so that's one color and I'll move around whoa splay it out again So see how that makes like little straggly, scaggly um, tassels. Okay, and we don't have another. Now we'll go into the deeper color. And we'll make different colors. Now we'll go one deeper. The black plum. We've got a couple of colors. Got to make sure you have liquid in your brush. Otherwise you won't get the scraggly look. Okay, so a little bit up there at the top, I feel like I have a little bit of a kind of explosion happening and I'm not liking how it looks. Okay, so I, it, it is blowing, but there's like no grace to this thing. So we'll fix that. All right now I'm gonna go into um, the coral rose. Is it coral rose? That coral color with water and then I'll give that a couple of little highlights keep them a little shorter so that they're not exploding and that just gives a nice layered little tassel look we'll do the same thing with our greens if I can find a spot on my palette Now that Bunny is painted, okay, I've got that too solid. Now that Bunny is painted, I can put the little tassels on him. Go into highlight color. Be careful about getting too highlighted back there because that would not be the right place to have a lot of highlights. So we can go into a shade color. Water drops are also good to pick up with your shadow colors. And a little, oops, that's black, not black green. I'm not sure I can tell the difference here. Alright, we'll go with a very dry brush into our sour apple. We just want that on the tip and cut the corner. I'm laying way back on my brush to be able to get that tip. So see, we didn't have to do two floats coming in like that. My bird's um, stuff over here seems to be a little bit flat. I'm going to perk him up. Remember we were talking earlier, I never ever paint without going back through and perking things up. I think I want a little bit brighter on the, the holly. And a little further. Okay. Get out the easy dot tool. And I think I need the bigger one. On a small project, I use the little one. These are the most handy little guys. They have every size of brush head that you'd want to use. Normally you use the, the back side. What I like about it is it tells you a number on each one. This is a number one, two, three, four. So you can say, oh, number one's a size I always get from my fine ornaments. And then you can be like number four on the yellow one is the size I get when I do whatever else. So um, it's nice because it has that um, number size. If You can't tell if I have a thing of brushes. I cannot tell what the back end of that brush looks like. So you don't know to pick up 
and half of them have these mixing handles on them, so um, you don't know what you're getting, so it's nicer just to have a little tool. And we'll make a couple of big fat berries, which will shade when they're dry. Make sure you wash off your dot tool early on, otherwise it gets thicker and thicker. Now, if I wanted to bring some red down here, I could put a cut, little sprig, and why don't I? A little baby berry sponge on his hat. So see, now that brings the red down there, and it, so it's not such an isolated color. And we could put a little one on the bird, but the bird is very red already. All right, to do some finishing, um, we need to put some yellow color on, and we'll have a little bit more yellow color, so we're going to do camel on his belly, just to give him some warmth. He'll have more yellow glow down here when we move forward. So this is also moving these highlight colors that were in our stick arms and things like that up into Mr. Snowman. And so we might want to move down a brush size. here. And now, switching brushes. Now, see, I've used three of these brushes just for one light technique, and I can't muddy these colors. Now I'm into Diox Purple. And Diox is going to do a really fun, magical thing for us, and it is going to create a beautiful, kind of cool, shadowy purple luster back in our shadows. And that just changes the tone of him completely. Purple and yellow snowmen are much more magical. Whoops, that was a little wet. Than um, just black and white and gray. We'll bring that color in from both sides. And we can even give Birdie a little bit of purple in him. We can put some in our scarf. And we just start spreading the love. You can use a little bit more. <clears throat> Keep your lines round. Okay, so if you're pulling it around this area, you need to make sure you arch. You see the difference? Actually, when I got to the end of the project, um, on the, the one, the paper towel hider holder, when I got to the end of that, I actually took a picture just in case I screwed it up because I was so afraid of what I was about to do. Sometimes it's much nicer to have somebody else walk you through things. Okay, we can get a little bit deeper. Deeper equals drama. Now we can go onto his hat. 
Okay, we're going to shade the little berries with very dry, um, very dry float of soft black. Very, very dry. I'm going to blot that. The smaller your stuff is, the less you want it to float around. Okay. We'll add a little sparkle because berries are um, hard and so anything that has um, a hardness and a shininess to it can get a sparkle. Depending, of course, if you want to put attention to it. So we'll use a little, just a little divot of white. And give them just a little bit. Okay, we want to highlight the candle, um, the the lantern, that thing, with dry rub of cocoa. Shape following, so you want to go along the lines. I don't know that I really want to do any highlighting at the bottom. Highlight there. A little bit of cocoa. No, that's going to be camel on the finial. Maybe a highlight on that front edge. And then we can shade with the um, dark chocolate. And then we'll, I think we just stick with the bittersweet, I think. Gives us a little bit of dimension. We'll get that shadow. And then we'll shade around this stuff. Bittersweet. And even just kind of shade the back. Alright, we're going to highlight the candle with a little bit of the. Yeah, I'll think of the name Coral Blush. But tricky because it spans either side of the thing. And we'll highlight just that upper edge. And I think just shading the um, base of it with a little bit of something deeper like the alizarin. One of the things that is easier, I have just had to take out like every color because I did this last. I should have had this based first. And then I wouldn't have wasted so much time with the colors. Okay, so that brings us down with a little bit of red down there as well. That's a good thing to have. Okay, now we're going to do a little bit of magic with... little bit with mustard seed and we'll glow And we'll just dry rub. Add a little bit more. I'll go back in and patch now don't forget it's coming out of 
from behind that lantern. Okay, that's kind of fun. Okay, now I'll do some patching. Okay, I'm putting a little bit of cocoa on the edges. Just a little rougher. I think if I get that just like it's brighter, chunkier highlights, I'm getting a little bit more like that's metal. Okay, yeah, I like that better. And we could go, I think I need to patch my, the red. All right, I want to put some, st I want to put a stenciled snowflake overhang here. Um, so I've got, this is a two part um, snowflake stencil, it's really elegant. We've got, what do we have here? We've got snowflakes, 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 snowflakes. We've got lots of stencils for snowflakes. There's one that's a good border that I've used. All right, I've decided on the elegant snowflake. I'm going to use Tack It Over and Over. Ooh, this one's not open. So. Tack it over and over makes your stencil act just like a giant post-it note. Okay, it is your best friend. I'm going to use a jumbo dauber. And then I'm going to just flatten it on my palette. And I'm going to just put that all around and in between. I'm on a piece of wax paper. The thicker you use, uh, the, the thicker you apply it, the stickier it gets. And depending on how delicate your stencils are, you want to be careful of that. So you keep it really, really fine, and the way you keep it fine is you just make sure you pounce off over here. I'm just going to go ahead and make everybody sticky right now. That way this stencil is ready for me to use anytime. It's nice to do this. Um, just get a big table, wax paper, and um, a roller, and just do a whole bunch or all of your stencils at the same time and leave them on the wax paper until they dry clear. Don't leave any big white chunks or that stays sticky for a long time or forever, kind of. Okay, so I'll just move that over and let it dry. And I'll do the other one. I had decided that I want to put one of these flourishes down here at the bottom. And I've already painted one just to see how it looked. Um, and I wanted to introduce you. There's a whole bunch. This one's got a snowflake on a ledger. So it's real straight. That would be really pretty framed on a piece. One with scrolls. Um, this one's just a cluster of them. And then we've got some new ones. They're very delicate, very awesome. This would be fantastic on a piece um, with holly. Here's a bunch of scrolls. Here is just flourishes. This one's holly. More scrolls. Um, lots and lots and lots of choices. They're on the website. And I want to show you how you paint these because that is a pain in the tushy. So I think we'll get another piece of wax paper. And we're going to use our magical little brush. This brush is called a, an Italian sash brush. And what's unique about it is it's got a little bit of a floppy head to it, but it's got real stiff bristles. So on one hand, it does a really good stipple, but on the other hand, it'll get into, it's got little, um, it'll separate so that it'll get into these little nooks and crannies. So if I was base coating this, um, we'll just say the gray color, and that is the color. So the colors are that you base it with gray, the slate gray. And the reason I did slate gray is to start out closer to my colors, to like the colors. I can't jump straight to white on that dark blue. So we come over here and we hold this down and we just start tapping its little edges. And you want to be careful because these are very delicate. 
you know, you need to go into this knowing that they're delicate and treat them respectfully because, yeah, they will break. And then, and then what do you do, right? Okay, so we just do this and we just tap to, to fill the edges. I really thought that these would be a stupendous pain in the tush to get um, base coated. I didn't have any idea when we started this how in the world we would get them base coated. But this works remarkably well. Okay, you're going to get dirty fingers. Okay, then we go into our next color. But you might want to go ahead and go into a white that is dirty brushed. And you might bring that onto the snowflakes. And then on our scrolls, and we can do a little bit more too, I'm going to sprinkle some um, glamour dust over the top. Okay, and you can choose when you do that. You might want to varnish them first. Varnish before glitter. That's the law of, of varnish. Okay, um, then we can take just a scumbly brush and go into our purple. And we can decide how purple we want those and how exact. It could just be a kiss of color. It could be everywhere, whatever you like. This is where it's just fun. Just have fun with this. Okay, so get like that. And then while it's wet or... Um, and actually, here, I'll show you a better way. Okay, I have gotten out... Let me move this guy so you can see. I got out some texture glass. This is a really unique product because this dries perfectly clear and it looks like glass. It's really shiny. So I think for our little stencils that that would look really awesome. Used a palette knife and I'm just going to use a clean sash brush and I'm going to go over it and it will look very shiny, very glassy when I get done. And it would be very hard to see on camera so don't worry about that. Right now notice that it all looks white and that is because um, it is um, not opaque until it's not clear until it dries. Now I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to glitter my snowflakes. So I'll just pour that on and let it go into that clear liquid. Okay. And then you can tap off after everything dries, so just leave that alone, let it dry clear, and you're going to be amazed. What's really neat too about this product is it also. Um, is flexible. So I'm going to use it, I think, on this um, this banner right here. And it actually will flex with my banner. Okay, uh, I'm just going to move that on there until it dries. Got a little internal debate going on with myself about the two projects. Okay, so I have the banner and we're going to have, you know, the topper and stuff like this. And then I've got this magic stuff coming through. I think the magic stuff really adds a lot, but I've got a little bit extra space and I can't decide if I have room for some stencils um, for some snowflakes. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do the magic dust because I think I do need it. I think I really like the, that effect, but I might be sneaking in some stencils in a little bit. So um, we'll see. All right, we've got um, the slate gray and one of the big crescent stencil brushes. And we'll look at where my path has gone. Over here. So we've got our big word and we've got all this and we've got this stuff happening here. I think my first sparkle is going to need to land right here on the center of his hat. So we'll just sparkle, sparkle, and then we'll bring it around. So we're telling a story with our we're telling a story with the this stuff. Bring that and we'll see what's happening there. Okay, so we're going to go into slate gray and we'll whip that around there and then we're going to have it come back off, kind of connect and come around. We'll go around the back side of him. Have it ching right there. So that's the thing. It's going to float around and it's making magical stuff happen wherever it lands. 
This is the scariest thing in the world to do. If you're really afraid of it, burnish first. Then you can wipe it off. Okay, so now we'll have it come out the side of his head from behind him. Zoom. And it'll hit the bird on the head. And it'll come down around. And what should we do next? Okay, so we're doing it in an opposite direction from our other thing, but that's okay. Maybe we'll have it, well I guess it can go back around. I don't want to mute that glow too much. We'll have it land here. And then we make some swirly, swirly, swirly snow. We're making movement. Okay, so what if you absolutely hate what you've done? One of the things that you could do, and I've got a little example here, is you can dip your eraser. I'm going to get a bigger eraser than this into, um, say, I don't like this in here. Dip it in water, and it'll erase whatever was freshest paint. So if you're within five minutes or so, you can erase with your eraser. It works with, let me see if I can find some of my other erasers. The, this is a triple threat. This one's a micro eraser. It'll erase, if I dip with water, I can go on to, say, over here where I've got some dip in water and presto, I have erased paint. This only works while it's fresh. So dry, it won't touch your paint. Um, wet, it will take your paint off. And that's kind of a cool, cool backstory for erasers. Um, and I don't think it's all erasers, by the way, so I think you have to make sure you test it. But those two at least work. Okay, so let's have some more swirling snow down below. I think we'll end up having some snowflakes and things like that down here too. Let's bring some swirls. So we've got all kinds of stuff happening down here. I like it. Nice and blowy and blustery. Okay, so this is where you assess. You sit there and you look at it and you say, okay, is it what I would want? Is it distracting? Is it awesome? Is it, what is it? You know, is it good? So once you have it where you like it, um, and you like the kind of the layout of it, because I could go back over and scumble in some blue, and it wouldn't be a problem. So like, it's, it's not as dangerous as it looks. Start in your brightest areas. I know I want his hat to be hit pretty bright. Now I've changed colors. And the color that I'm into now is that lighter gray, the, um, I'm looking for it, the gray sky. And you know, have it be, and keep it off his head. Get a new pute if I lost my old one. Ching! There he goes on his hat. This is a technique that I picked up from an old, old, by old toll painting books. Boy, I'll tell you what, you can learn a lot from them. There are some really groovy techniques. There was a Cinderella book or something. And I was painting furniture for somebody and they had this fairy dust in there and I was like, oh, this is so cool. All right, so now we'll bring it around the back side here. And 
and you can stipple where you want it the strongest. And now you just repeat your snow. Oops, helps with them on the table. Okay, now we go into white. Same thing, repeat, rinse and repeat. side of the paper towel here. Okay, and then we're going to add some stardust. So over here you want to keep that a little less pronounced and fuzzier. And we'll just reinforce. Don't want it too stripey down here. A little crazy is probably good. We'll put some sparkle dust down there. And we're going to glitter this thing up too. I mean, there's no sense in having a winter welcome banner that is not insanely awesome. You know, that's like, that's what's cool about painting is, especially for winter. Like, look at the weird stuff we do for Halloween. You know, I mean, we definitely need to break it all out for winter because winter is boring. Well, don't tell these guys I said so because I think they pretty much dig it. All right. Alright, we've got lots and lots of stuff, so now what do we do? Now we break out our Raphael. Raphael brush, ugliest liner in the world. Look at how fuzzy that guy is until you get it wet. So now, can you see what a fine point? Let's get you in closer. This is a number one. Any of the sizes would do, although the number four is not as uniform. So look at how tight that is, a, just a microscopic pinpoint right there on the tip. Okay, um, and all it, this is natural fibers. They are hand cut, hand tied. They'll last you 30 years. You only will need one for a long, long time. Okay, so we get this wet and we let it sit for a few minutes because we want some fine, fine lines for our um, stardust. Okay, we're going to go with the Raphael and we're going to thin our white paint with a little bit of water. <clears throat> I've got it juicy loaded. If you want to control it, just squeeze out some of the paint. Okay? And when you get over onto your piece, you'll see that it will do super, super, super. It's so fine lines, you won't even be able to believe it. Okay? All right. Now, what we do is we look for the places we want to highlight first. We want big, 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 big here. Okay, and maybe stronger. And then we start putting in little stuff. Okay, and what I love about the raft is it will do these little dots that are strange that have like a chunk on them, but they're kind of fine pointy awesome for wheat stalks. If you've ever tried to do those, it's a little bit tricky. Well, I've got a little bit bigger than I thought I wanted it. And we'll just continue on. So we'll put these strong ones where there is like emphasis and then we're going to go in with our easy dot tool as well. 
and then we go back and we start sprinkling. Do not count where these are. That is the worst thing you can ever do because it'll, it'll tighten you up and you won't make pretty stardust. Okay, that's like, don't count. I know I'm going to say that and I know some of you are going to do it anyway. But um, it's like so tempting to do. Okay, so now let's sprinkle in. I'm just kind of tapping, dabbing at. Try not to line them up. I'm doing a really bad job of that. Highs and lows. Okay, and that's going to make us magic dust. Now you have to go back in and you have to add some really bright ones. So we're going to go back up here to our centers of interest and we'll add some really bright overemphasized guys. They can't be everywhere because if they're everywhere they won't be special. If you want a couple of really kind of like little bright stars, put them out in the blue. And that makes them more special because they're on the dark. Now we go in, we've got a little squiggles everywhere, right? And we look for the Easy Dot tools, which you can find it over here. We're going to use the number one and fresh paint. And we're going to put dots and things. Okay, so we'll dot the centers of some of our stars. And that really, really makes it look more magical. This is where your bridge, I lost my bridge, where is it? Comes in handy because I am about to make a dot mess. And if I mess it up and I put my hand through it, I'm going to smear on everything and that would make me cry. I don't want smeared dots. Isn't it funny how just a little bit of light and contrast will make things magical? Sparkles. I don't know how much attention I want this to have down here, so I'm going to back off of that. Okay. Alright, I think I'll leave it there for right now. And I'm looking for... I'm going to go ahead and hit the blow dryer so that I can show you how to do the stencils on top. Okay, so we've got some different sizes. I think I'm going to need something... Debate on. I want kind of simple. Okay, so. And I don't have very much space. But I want. Let's put something full in this corner. And we're going to use our fingertip dauber. And we'll use some of the um, gray sky color. Now, this makes all the edges stick down. Use just a little bit of white at our edges. Lot that on a paper towel and a little bit more gray sky. Okay, and we'll pull this off and see how it looks. Okay, 
so far so good. Let's flip them over and see how that's going to look. Okay, so yeah, I like that. So we'll have just some cascading snowflakes. Now we need a couple of maybe something bigger and more open. Oops, hello, how to stick your brushes to your stencil. All right, need something kind of in the middle. That's huge. Okay, now I can see where it's overlapping, so I want to be careful not to just, you know, repeat. I don't want a cluster of confusion. that off. And maybe a big one back here. But what we'll do here is we'll use the dark gray color on the big background one. So see how that just has a couple of layered looks to it. And we might go something here. We'll go into the gray. Maybe a mix of both. Okay, so that just gives us some snowflakes flowing down. And we'll see how that looks when we cut it out. Once you've got done with your stencils, the way I store them, and do I have, is I've got this um, Z-shaped rack with all these clips on them, okay? And so you can just clip them up according to, and I've got three or four clipped here together. If you put a sheet of vellum and stick them to the vellum, what happens is it sticks just enough, but it doesn't totally stick. Um, and it doesn't, like Tack It Over Never loves paper, but it doesn't care for vellum. So you put this in between, you stick your two snowflake stencils on either side and just clip them up together, like so. Okay, so now I've got this cut up here. I want to do something up here, but I'm not sure what, but I do have it in my brain that I'm going to cut these out, because I don't want just a line there. So flip my guy back on his belly there. We're going to get a cutting mat. One of the reasons I love the fingertip daubers is I like the ones with the caps on them because I can keep that paint fresh. Okay, we're going to get our fingertip um, precision cutter. Okay, and put my finger in the right way. And I have got my blade in backwards. Hang on. All right, I want to cut these out. So I've got my retractable um, fingertip blade. And I think I want a little bit of a straight edge. So I'll get a see-through ruler, and I think what I'll do is I'm just going to cut alongside. This is this blades are so sharp, and what I love about this is you're using your fingertip, the top, like the pad right here, to press. And you know how when you use a Zacto knife, you get like mega, mega, like kill yourself. Oh, it's horrible. I hate Zacto knives. I hate knives that are shaped like Zacto knives, we'll put it that way. So I'm just going to follow some straight edges. Okay. And make some cutouts. All right, I love, 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 love. Okay, I can't say it enough. Love that. That is what is so cool about Rocklawn. No, no, it doesn't shred, it doesn't fray. Um, I'm going to get out my Prussian blue. I can find it. There we are. Prussian blue, and we're going to do a little bit of edge edging. And so we'll just take our big old giant um, workhorse um, angle shader, and I want to bring this down a little further than I thought I wanted it because it's wanting to back into the um, the wood topper. So I want it a little bit more dangly. And then we're just going to shade those edges to soften that down and make it be part of the team. 
frames it in really nicely. Okay, and we're of course going to have to do some glitter and things like that up there. I'll lean that out and then we're going to load our brush and do the same thing with the sides. Bring that down a little darker. Okay, and that just richens things up. I don't know if richens is a word, but... We're going to take a little piece of Velcro and attach it right there. That little um, self-adhesive Velcro-y stuff. Okay, and we'll bring this down. We do the same thing on the top of the um, topper, or the, the napkin paper towel holder thing. I can't get that name straight. I'm excited about it, but I just can't get my name, get the name to come off the edge. Okay, we'll bring this up. Those of you who love the color purple could totally put a little more purple in this. I think that would be very appropriate. Okay, so that makes things shine a little bit. We didn't bring in a little bit of our Indian turquoise, and I think I want some of that. So besides shading the edges with the Prussian blue, then we can bring in a little bit of Indian turquoise here and there um, just to make things, I don't know, just to do stuff. Okay, so wherever we think we want some. We could totally come out here and there. Yes, it's one of those colors that looks really pretty. Yeah, ooh, look at that in the white. That looks really neat down there. Yeah, that, that adds depth to our sparkles. You know, it's one of those colors you can't even really tell that you've used it until you look at it and you're like, yeah, I love that. Okay. So then we hang this over the front. Let me see how that looks. Love it. Okay, some finishing touches on this part, okay, for both pieces. Um, and I did this. I did this on the hat band I have used. The, um, these are the new Glamour Dust, and I've got to tell you, when we brought these out for If the Shoe Fits, holy moly, I cannot believe, I threw away my first batch of these. Um, I got them, and then I was like, yeah, whatever, I gave them away to a friend or another painter or something. And um, then I needed just a little bit of something. Ended up, I had one bottle, used it, loved it. They're flexible, they are ultra-fine glitter inside paint. When they dry, you can't get the glitter. Oops, it's on this one. Can't get that glitter off because I didn't put it on. You can't get the glitter off. It doesn't come off in your hands. It is safe glitter, if you know what I'm saying. Okay, it is absolutely safe. So um, this is going to be used. Now, if I put it on right now, I can't take a picture. Okay, so I have to put it on after I get my photograph. But it's going to be used at least on my hat bands, black on my hats, um, and just have fun with it. It is so much fun. So, and oops, and there's the clear one. And it, it's very, very, let me show you on this. It's very, um, I'll show you what it looks like. The application is easy. You do want to varnish before you um, put this on. Okay, because I think it flattens a little bit with varnish. It's almost like it's got a little varnish in it. Okay. So, and I would do more than one coat in areas that you want them really sparkly and glittery. But it's very sheer. Okay, so what you get is almost like, do you remember those um, highlighters from years ago? Um, the Hot Shots colors, which are still out, by the way. Um, and they're still awesome. But anyway, so you can totally just get, just by a simple base coat, just a wash over the top, and you get a glitter coat that looks amazing. So get them in all the colors. There's not very many. There's like 11 or 12 colors. And you will want them for layering on top of things. Let me show you the green. 
And see, they come out like milky looking, but they're not milky at all um, when they dry. When they dry, they're crystal clear. So his little scarf and stuff, that's way too thick, needs that. And then it will dry it, and you can see. Really hard to show on camera. Really amazing in person. Um, trust me, trust me. This is one of those things that you just have to say, okay, I trust you. And But it's you will not go wrong. This is amazing stuff. All right, we're going to seal our wood. I've got the, um, if the shoe fits on the back side, and it should have been sealed when I did it. Multi-purpose sealer, especially if you're going to hang it outside where the weather can get to it. So you want to make sure that you protect it. We'll do multi-purpose sealer. And actually, it looks like I did do the back side. It would be turning a very dark color if it had not been done. Okay, this is where you want to protect your backside with, um, which sounds just wrong, doesn't it? Um, you want to protect the backside of your project with that, um, <laughs> that, that stuff, the self-sticking stuff that I talked about in the beginning because you want to make sure you don't make a mess. Okay, I'm going to base coat it with bittersweet chocolate and I'll see you in the back when I get that done. All right, I'm getting ready to start on my base here. Um, and this is just going to be a plain base because my um, piece goes in front. So I'll just do this some nondescript dark color or whatever. But for the topper, I've started my, my, um, my snowman. And it's just a snowman. You can make anything into a topper. You just put a screw and a washer in the bottom. Okay, And then I drilled some holes and I found some twigs. But I think my little bird needs to sit on his on his arm, but he needs a top hat, right? So like he can't not have a top hat when everybody in this whole design has a top hat. So I have to make a top hat. How am I going to do that? I'm going to take my quick wood. I'm going to take a glove. And actually this is so small I'm not going to even use my gloves. I'm going to take the quick wood, which is a two-part epoxy that is sandable when you get done with it. Like you can sand it, you can um, drill it, you can do anything you want with it. I'm going to take off this cap, in theory, okay, and I'm going to cut off a little piece. And that piece is the end piece, so I don't want that one. Um, and then I'm just going to cut off a really little piece. And it looks, it's got two pieces to it, and so it doesn't activate until you mix the two pieces, which is the epoxy part. Wipe that knife off and retract. Okay, I'm going to put the cap back on the, the cover and then I'm going to put that back in its tube. Okay, I'll peel off the plastic. And what I love, 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 love is this material does not stick to epoxy, which I don't know if you're familiar with epoxy, but there are not very many things that that doesn't stick to. Okay, so I way have way too much here. That's unfortunate. Um, so you mix it together. Okay. It's things like adding top hats, in my opinion, that make these projects just shine. So I'll pinch off a little bit. Okay, and I'll make it about the size that I think I need it. And I think, let's see, he's going to, I guess I could probably form that right on top of his head. Okay, so that's probably good. And then we'll come here and we'll make him a little brim. That's too much. Should make like 10 top hats while I'm at it. Okay, so make a little brim out of this. Roll him smoother. Flatten his top. Come on. Okay, now I have a little top hat for my little bird. Okay, and I'll just go ahead and peel that off. I'll put it on his head and glue it in place, or I can put it on now. But once that dries, then I can paint it just like wood. All right, we've got our little topper, and we're going to use white, or maybe the gray sky. Maybe a mix of both. And we're going to dry rub right in between the little arms. I think 
give him a little depth. And actually, we'll just go all the way around his middle, around his face. That'll give him little indented shadings right there. Increase it to more white. Okay, we're going to shade the hat with black. And shade his rim. Let that dry. I'm going to go ahead and base um, his hat band in the red and um, put his little face on the same colors, same thing as on the video. That's like a no brainer here. So if I feel like there's something different, I'll come back on and show you. All right, so now we're going to dry rub um, with some milk chocolate. Just in plankish type strokes. Streaky, scratchy, dry, long arm movements. Try not to make those little stop marks like I just did. Okay, but you want it irregular so you can have some highs and some lows. use this technique for so many so many projects if you want to press less you can leave your brush wetter for streaks for streak years I'll just leave it a little wetter I'm wanting a little oops little faster, not quite that fast. A little faster technique than just the dry, dry rubbing. So that's really, really gentle pressure. Okay, but I like the scumbliness of it. That is a good look. Just real super soft, almost like you're sweeping, except for you're not pressing down so hard. Start forming the board um, highs and lows by leaving some spaces. I wouldn't mind if this board turns out just a little bit lighter than with the shoe fits because I think this could use just a slightly more brown to go with the tan of the arms. You know how we've been trying to work our colors through the piece. So if I put a little bit more on here, tone down that first brown, I don't think that'll be a bad thing. Then we'll go into Coco. I think that's Coco. Is that Coco? Yeah, that's Coco. Okay, we're 
we're just getting some dry, rough texture. Okay, so what happens if you have some of those that you don't like? Maybe I don't like that. Well, what happens is I'm just going to go back over and do a series of glazes that will tone anything down that you don't like. Or you'll find yourself going back and adding more of them. Which is generally, I'll be like, ew, I hate that. And then, wah, let's have more. Okay, yeah, that's getting nice and grainy looking. And then we'll go into our camel -y color. And that looks a little bit light for what I've got going on so far. So I think I'll go back to cocoa. can just do a myriad of colors. Okay, I'm going to park that for right now. Alright, I'm going to shade my boards with um, bittersweet chocolate. Is that true? I think we're going to go with, yeah, I need something darker. The bittersweet chocolate going to go ahead and just glaze the tops and the bottoms of the boards. See how that's already bringing the wood kind of together. We might even go into a little bit of asphaltum. Asphaltum's a warmer, happier color. Bittersweet is just a little bit kind of harsh. Okay, look at that top and bottom. Kind of get your wood grains on the ends if you want to. Choose where you want your line. I am now uh, working off of three palettes. Got kind of like a line right here. I'm going to go ahead and make some wood grain. A little cockeyed, huh? shade to the other side. This is doing two things. It's glazing those colors together and it's giving me some lines. Oops, I don't want that. No. Wrong line. This line. So anything that you don't like, you can just kind of glaze over. I'm going to get my big half inch rake, White Wonder, and I'll go into the cocoa color. I'm cuckoo for cocoa color. And we're going to put some streaks in. Some green. Okay. Now I'll go into this is fun. A little bit of black. I'm gonna 
blot that. I don't want it too strong. I'm going to bring that in from the edge like some stuff is old. Okay, and we'll bring this in. I'm using just the chisel edge. I've got just a little bit of a glare going on here. It's much nicer if I can see what I'm painting. Sometimes you can let things go as like happy little accidents. And sometimes you need to fix them. And make some splits on the end by raking. We need to spatter, so we're going to spatter with our browns from our palette. A little bit of black. Spattering always does the trick. We'll take our one, um, our round brush. And we'll add some nail holes with the graphite. And they're just going to be the ones that you know that they used to hand make. So I've got a big old water drop right there. And we'll let this dry. We're going to float a little bit of black underneath each of those nail heads to make them pop out, just like the snowman's nose. There's a lot of similar techniques when you start getting down to it. You can line in there just a little bit stronger if we want to, to increase contrast of the black. Like that's really a crack, you know. We can make some excess ones if we want to, so this board can totally be split. And that's chipped and cracked. Same thing over here. This one needs a little chip and a crack. thing about chips and cracks is not to do the same thing everywhere. This could totally be like really split though. Okay, so it's just an old, old sign. There we go. I like it. See how easy that is? Okay, so we're going to go um, next. Oh, we need to put a little highlight on our nail heads with our gray and that's going to be with the same slate gray. I need to dry that off. It needs to be just, uh, oops, not that bright. We don't want these shiny ten penny nails, you know, we don't want them real bright, but we do need something over there. Okay, after a test, I've decided that my letters are going to be blue. I'm just going to stroke those on. I'm doing a mix of the Ultra, Ultra Blue Deep and White, about half and half. Not too chunky on your brush. press a little bit harder for the ones that you want to be thicker letters. Alright, a tip on lettering is you never try to go all the way around things. And if your hand doesn't stay on the line, you don't worry about it. You go where your hand is going. Break your line, you know, so don't don't try to make the whole letter in one line. So like this letter right here, 
oops, too much water, and wipe it off if you, when in doubt, wipe it back and start again. Okay, so I just make that stroke, I make part of this stroke, stroke backwards to the base, and then downwards to the base. I never try to make all the strokes at one time. Okay, and we'll cross our T's. Oops. Let me let that dry. Dot our eyes. Okay, now we have a little bit more work to do. We need to do some drop shading, which is going to be in black. <clears throat> Okay, and you're going to select your side. I always kind of go to the left side. These are pretty fine letters, so you want to keep it fairly lightweight. It's going to make it look slightly carved, and it'll give it a little bit more structure. Now we decorate. Okay, so I'm going to dry off my brush. I'm going to make a lighter mix of the blue and white. I'm going to roll my brush so it's tinier, and I'm going to wipe some of it off. Now I'm going to dry brush down the tops. I'm just kind of skidding down the top. Brightening up just the top of the letter. I'm not worried about measuring. I'm not going to... Don't stress about lettering. It's way easier than your thinking it is. Okay. By the time you're done, it's going to be all kinds of things layered in here, so don't, no stressing. It's the stress-free letter zone. Okay. Mix a little bit more of our color. And continue. Alright, now we'll go into white and just pull out some white that's barely tinted and we'll do up towards the very top so we get that graduation don't want it really white white because it'll start kind of glowing just tint tops and it goes faster and faster as you do it I'm paring down the details on my guy here, my little snow guy, but I am going to go ahead and red up with glitter the hat, and I'm going to black it with glitter as well. That's going to really make this topper stand out, having those glitterified. And I think, whoops, we'll throw them on the ground, and I think we'll go ahead and make our bird glitterified as well. I don't think you can have enough glitter, especially when it comes to simple little things. I'm going to put the ice crystal, which is the clear, on my little guy. And I think that's just going to make him pop. And since it's clear, I can go over all the details. And that'll make him just a sparkly little guy. without being a mess. Yeah. And we've got some little glitters that come in. These little vials, which I love. I'll tape down. But they come in fading colors. And so I want to do a technique that I haven't done in a while. We're going to use beaten glitter glue. I'm going to test a letter. So this is the bead and glitter glue, and it is actually like a glue magnet. Okay, we're going to do a little glitter fade. We're going to do the light glitter at the top. And we'll just glitter as we go. Use the glitter trays to dump it out so you don't waste it all. Then you can dump it back in your vials. Glitter 
There's you go. Come on. Okay, I'm counseling the glitter. So we'll just do all these and then we'll do the lower. And let's see how far we can get on one. I love that these colors kind of fade it fade in together. That is super duper. Okay, we're gonna use glue and we'll glue in the little arms. Okay, and then we'll glue the bird either to his hat or to his arms. I'm not sure my arms are sturdy enough. Alright, I've got my lazy my paper towel holder um, just about finished. I've got my finial on top. He just has his little magnet spot right there. Things are drying. I've got glue drying in different places. Now I've got a couple of options here. Okay, I've got a snowflake swirl to put here. I want to be really careful though. If I want to reverse this board, I'm going to have to make sure that this swirl is above this back board right here. Okay, otherwise I can't reverse it and it will sit on the back. Um, but I kind of like the idea of having this little thing sticking out the side just a little bit and just kind of framing things. I like that. So I think I'm going to sacrifice the reversibility of this for this. The other thing that I have been playing with is I could put feet on this and it would look pretty darn sharp with some feet. So I played around with that. I think I decided not to put feet on in this case, although I really like them. Er, maybe I need to just put the feet on. What you're going to do if you put the feet on, you're going to put them on at the bottom and then you can still unscrew this and you can pop out your um, panel. So you just want to make sure that you don't attach them to the front board unless you want them to come off with the front board.